I'm Tom Hoppy, and I'm your host of the Most Painful Podcast. Military veterans suffer from chronic pain twice that of the Canadian population. And why is that? When a person joins the service and they get into the military culture and their identity changes and their mindset changes to mission first, self last, does that impact how they manage and view chronic pain? To talk about this today, I'm joined by two guests. Melanie Knoll is a professor at the University of Calgary who studies chronic pain in children and is currently working on a project with the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence researching chronic pain in veterans' family. Hi, Tom. Hélène Le Soler is a military veteran who is completing her PhD on the crisis of identity with veterans who suffer from operational stress injury. Hello, Tom. So I'd like to just start by saying we know that when a soldier enters or a person enters the military, that the culture creates an environment for an identity and mindset to change from their civilian mindset to the military mindset. There's a lot of research out there. We know that the military common mindset is mission first, team, regiment, and self last. How does that impact a person when they're leaving the service? Ellen, can you maybe give us some insight into that? Well, that's interesting because, you know, it's important to know why the person has joined the service, I think, to see how um, impactful the identity they're getting from the military uh, becomes something that they are so attached to. So while they're leaving the service, what I've experienced through my study is to see that the family component is so important. We say that the military family is becomes sometimes, you know, the, the first family the, the, the person will have because, you know, often the, the person will have to leave the family, the biological family, because, you know, to, to serve, they will have to move from a different region to another one. So that family becomes your identity at some point. So leaving the forces is something that is very difficult because it's like, am I leaving again my family or am I being rejected by my family? So I think this is something that is very important for the identity uh, portion of it. Well, the three of us have talked before about this. And Ellen, with your study, I mean, you're looking at people who are actually forced to leave versus people who are leave voluntarily, which I think would be an added complexity to the identity adjustment that, that they're going through. Is that correct? Yes, it is correct. Because when it's not a choice and, you know, at some point you're not prepared for that, you're not, you know, it's, you're not even in a process of mourning what you're going to be leaving. So, so yes, it is something that I've looked at and it's very interesting to see how longer and, and the, it's more difficult for them to overcome you know, the transition because of that. Yeah. And that's where, you know, some of the vets, veterans I've worked with and the coaching that we've done is it's the understanding that we've changed when we've gone into the service, not the civilian world. And, um, you know, Melanie, we, we just talked about this earlier today is, you know, in, in the military, at least in my experience and, and in my trade, you know, you, people would say, you're weak. What are you, a civilian? You know, so we're cutting down that civilian world, which we one day will enter back into. So we're, we have this struggle that goes. So when, you know, as a veteran, we're struggling with that or military person. But what about the family, right? And the children. And, and Melanie, you, you guys have been doing some great work and uh, you've done some qualitative interviews. What really stands out from those interviews that, that you found? Yeah. And that great work is done with you, Tom. Um, and have you been really instrumental in, you know, really weaving in the importance of culture and identity. I think I study pediatric pain. I study why kids have pain and their parents have pain. And I study the connection between trauma and pain. So I thought, wow, you know, I'll study veterans. This will be easy. You know, like there's lots of PTSD. There's lots of pain. Their kids are at risk. Let's figure it out. And Honestly, like this has been like uh, getting like a, a whole PhD again, almost like it's almost anthropological in terms of how unique the culture is. Right. And Helen, like your work on identity, like this is this was the big thing that really slapped me in the face is in working with 
veterans and talking to these families and really seeing how some of the things that we understand in non-veteran families and kids are almost totally flipped in these families. An example would be, you know, you just talked about like, what is weakness? What does it mean to complain of pain? What is the risk inherent in admitting that you're injured or you have pain? And, you know, there's this one dad who talked to us and he described it as being cast from his herd. The social rejection, in a sense. So if this is the culture and you've got a child, what what does the child feel like they can express when it comes to their own pain experience and their own injury. And it's not just about pain, right? Like their own sadness, their own grief, their negative emotions, right? So I think the big thing for me, a couple of things is this importance of understanding before we even talk about pain, military mindset, which is what you're talking about, culture identity. And when we understand that, we can kind of understand these interactions, you know, mission first, you know, we had this great quote where a child is saying how they were like throwing up in the car and they had to pull over. But dad was like, no, we're returning the car on time, you know, like, and they were laughing about it. But but this sort of like, how do how does that culture? How do those things that are sort of ingrained within the training sort of manifest in the civilian world, you know, with their kids. But I will say, like, it's not all risk, right? Like, these families are also incredibly resilient. And a lot of the families would talk about the pride that they have of being a military family. And so there's a fine line, right? One thing that really stood out to me, Tom, in non-veteran populations, we talk a lot about how parents can be overprotective of children. So they kind of, like, feed into their pain or you know, let them stop doing chores and stay in the house and, you know, kind of helicopter-y kind of parenting. And we know that that's not good. Well, what we're seeing in these kids of veterans is a flip where they're almost protecting the parent, right? I'm fascinated. I think there's a lot to learn from these families. I I think I also want to say that they are so incredible in terms of being reflective And, you know, we have this one quote where a dad is saying, you know, I realize how I responded to my kid kind of about their pain wasn't really validating. And I really want to change that. And so there's this real receptiveness to kind of doing the work and really improving those interactions. So it's really inspiring. And and that's interesting when we talk about reflective, you know, understanding how we've changed. And, and Elaine, I think in your research when we spoke, you know, you say that some of the people who join the forces come from homes that may have had problems or issues in, in that, and they're looking for that new family. If this is impacting children and veterans' families, are, are we setting them up for some of those same issues that their parents went through? I don't know, Elaine, do you have any thoughts on that? That's a good question because I didn't necessarily look at the, the kids and, and the family uh, surrounding the, the veterans. But what's interesting is that, you know, in the military, you, you have to push through pain. You have to push forward. You have to, you know, like we said, mission first. So you have to achieve the mission. You won't leave the mission, you know, if it's not done or because you're in pain or because, you know, you feel weak that, that, that day, you know, you have to push through. So this is what we teach our kids, you know, as veterans or as military personnel to push through, you know, Continue, you know, you didn't push too hard. You didn't push as hard as, as you should have, you know. So it's it's something very interesting. The the I think the the relation to pain and how we then transfer that to our kids. Even if we look at treatment too, as well, you know how veterans approach pain, chronic pain. I can speak for myself, right? Is I didn't know what an interdisciplinary pain clinic was. Or what it was involved. You know, you go to physio for, you twist an ankle in the military, you go to physio for a week or two, and then you're back out on the kind of thing, pacing. And one thing I can say that very interesting in my research, because all of them, all my 15 participants as OSI, but almost all of them, 60% of them are living with chronic pain, but they were all minimizing what it was. And it's like, oh, it's normal. I have chronic pain. Like it's nothing. <laughs> so, you know, how do you work with that? And you're, you're about to talk about pacing yourself. How do you pace yourself when you're minimizing, you know, 
at you know from the beginning the, the pain that you're living with yeah and what is pacing when i first heard that i thought someone was going to run run alongside me right oh okay is that what we're doing so i, I know melanie is it's you're starting to see i as you said you see that in your research the the connection from the veteran down to the family and the children and how this identity and culture is ingrained and maybe the veteran doesn't even know they're acting that way because it's become normal. Yeah. I mean, I, and I also think, I believe every family in and of itself is its own culture, right? Has its own culture. I think what's really unique about the veteran community is like, I can't think of any other group of people that have all undergone the same training. Like it, that it like it's very unique in that sense, right? And I guess Helen as I was listening to you, there's a balance, right? Because pushing through pain can be good sometimes, right? And pushing too much is not. So like some of the families would say like, "Oh, you know, I push 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 till I crash." On the other hand, you know, there is a resilience and a an an attitude of, yeah, pushing through and you could do the that is actually very adaptive and helpful. So I think I think this is really nuanced in terms of like what's the ideal balance. It's not going to be the same for everyone either, right? Different kids have different needs. And when you know the complexity of doing family work is that you know the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? So who the spouse is, who the brother is, who the sibling, you know, who the veteran is all of their experiences kind of come together to create what is, you know, a very unique culture. So I think we're going to learn a lot about, you know, risk, but also resilience, I think, from these families and these kids. And while we know that kids of parents with PTSD and, you know, pain are at risk, we also know there are lots of ways that a child can be resilient through, you know, fostering effective communication within families through enjoying community traditions, having a sense of belonging in different groups. And so, uh, you know, my big shtick is like, yes, let's understand risk, but let's really understand resilience. And let's not wait for seven years to get this all published. And like, let's start doing something about it now and giving these families sort of the supports that they so rightly deserve. So I'm happy we're talking about kids and spouses, because I think when we talk to veterans, like they really care about their entire, you know, their entire families. But I think the kids have not received a lot of attention um, over the years. Well, and I mean, this is, you know, a veteran needs their family. And if they're struggling and their family's not understanding what's going on, then it's a challenge. And, and I guess I would put to the two of you as well, you know, we're talking about culture and identity and we talk about treatment for chronic pain. The practitioners probably need to know the difference as well as the researchers. You alluded to that, Melanie, when you talked about, oh, I thought this would just be another, another study. But you were aware and open to understanding that there is a different culture. So, I mean, what are some takeaways that, you know, of a clinician sitting there thinking, okay, I'm going to have a veteran come into my clinic. What should I think about or do differently that would make, you know, the treatment successful for this patient? Because pain is biopsychosocial. So how do we deal with the psychosocial side? So I'll open it up to Alain if you want to start. And Well, for me, I think there is need, there's a need of, you know, understanding the language, the wording professionals are using because for a veteran if you're talking about for example a posting for a civilian person won't necessarily mean the same thing because I was having a discussion with a student uh, not too long ago and she was saying to me you know you know a posting it's only moving somewhere else I said no 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 you don't understand there's a portion in posting that means that might it might not be a choice you know it might be imposed so you need to understand all the language and all the I would say the the dimension of some words that are so important in the veteran community. Being a civilian, it's something that it's, I don't know, normal. I don't know how to qualify that. But for a veteran, being a civilian, it's very clear that it's a non-military personnel. It's a person who never experienced something in the military. So because of that, a veteran will never be a civilian. So all the wording, I think it's very, very, very important. Well, and it's also just understanding as a practitioner too, is that the veteran may not disclose all their injuries because of their culture. One, they may not, 
you know, they may think it may impact their Veterans Affairs benefit, which not all veterans are on. There's only uh, about 110 modern day veterans that are on, I believe. So, you know, veterans themselves may not have understanding. And also because of the culture of it'll affect my career. But uh, yeah, I mean, from your point as a researcher, Melanie, what what really kind of stood out from you when you started jumping into this, you know, with the veteran culture and identity? Yeah, I mean, what stood I mean, I'm still learning, Tom, to be honest, right? Like, and, and I think this is one area of, of research where I feel like it's like, uh, I will say unethical to do this work without veterans at the forefront, right? Like, I think be- because of what you guys are both talking about, the importance of culture and identity, I don't have that lived experience. And so I think it's just like opening my eyes to like what this world is like, but I, I am an outsider, right? And so, I, I mean, I partner with people with lived experience in all of my research. This is one area where like it is necessary and like, right? Because because I, I think both in how we listen and what we ask and how we interpret what we're finding has to be within that lens of of your both of your like lived experience. The thing that's standing out to me is like, these families really care about their kids. I was at a program where, you know, the parent and and the the veteran and the spouse were kind of learning effective communication. And it was really interesting because one of their biggest concerns was like, how is this affecting my kid? And on the flip side, when they had to generate what were the things in their life that gave them joy and that got them through, it was like playing with my kids, being with my kids. And like that really struck me, right? I think, you know, the things that are standing out to me is like, I, I'm on this journey, I'm learning, I will never fully understand. That's why I, I kind of say it's like, I'm an anthrop- anthropologist, right? Like I'm kind of here looking at the culture, but really need people like you, you both to do this together, because of the importance of culture and identity. And I think we're going to learn a lot about resilience in these families, actually, probably more so than risk. But still on the journey. It's probably going to take a long time. That's why I need you guys. Well, and I would say it's it's also, you know, me learning from from other people too, because I think every person one sits down with, we can learn something. But, you know, and Ellen, we know many people who the day they're get ready to get out of the service, many feel that they're ready to to do that transition. And it's only six months or three months later when we talk to them, at least the number of people I've talked to, they realize something's not right. But it really takes almost reflection and awareness, I would think, to, you know, that's not in our culture, is it? <laughs> to have reflection and awareness. So, Well, just when you think about identity, you know, uh, in the military, we think as a group. We don't think as an individual. So when you get out and they're asking you to think as a whole, just one person, this is a different new world. So, yeah, I guess there's a lot to consider, you know, about transition. And, and you know, that that's really interesting, Helen and Tom, because, like, I think about how we have these programs, right? Like, they were not developed with veterans in mind. We have a way that we treat pain. Um, you know, come to the hospital, come to the clinic. It's all self-managed with self, 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 Right. And I think about, you know, maybe we should also be considering what is culturally competent treatment. And, you know, not not to say that some of the elements aren't effective or wouldn't be, but if if culture and identity are so important, I think we need to be careful in assuming that programs and treatments that were not developed with this culture in mind may not be ideal. So I've, I've been thinking about that. And I mean, we would say the same. We would say the same if we said, take this white treatment and give it to some kids who are indigenous or give it to some trans kids. If we're going to really think about, and we would say that's not appropriate, like it wasn't developed for them. So I think we need to kind of also take a step back and make sure we're not making assumptions. If we're really going to go the culture route, we need to really honor that and 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 question whether some of the things that we're doing or offering are or are not culturally appropriate. 
and just to wrap up here as we're running out of time in this discussion, I think we can go on for quite a long time because it is it does play a big role when you think of, you know, the research out there where a veteran uh, population does very well in a pain clinic. And then what, what about three, four months down the road when they're now they're out on their own, they're struggling with purpose, they're struggling with identity change. How does that then circle back into their chronic pain? So there's so much to unwrap here. And I know that uh, Veterans Affairs has just announced uh, for the Can Praxis program, for the families, which you're working on, Melanie. So that's, you know, I think that is a start to this is because yes, veterans are important, but so are the families. So, you know, I think that's a very positive step forward. So much more to discuss, and I'd love to talk more. And maybe we'll just have to have another podcast down the road to unwrap this even more. But uh, for now, I'd like to thank both of you for Arlen and Melanie for the work you're doing and for what you share today. And uh, I'd like to thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. The Most Painful Podcast is produced for the Chronic Pain Center of Excellence by Story Studio Network and Eye Contact Productions.